Okay, so I will start now with a presentation of uh, the CHIS uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, and CHIS is a, is a new center of excellence. It started uh, one and a half year ago, more or less. And we have a, it's a, a center of excellence lead by BSC. And uh, we have a, a quite diverse consortium, uh, which uh, includes uh, three tier zero uh, supercomputing centers, that's the BSC, HLRS, and Chineca, plus some other partners uh, from a diverse origin from academia, uh, companies or even uh, uh, monitoring uh, research and monitoring institution in the area of, of uh, solid earth. So the objective of uh, this center of excellence is uh, we have several objectives that are listed here. First, in terms of science, uh, when we started the project, we identified a number of uh, problems uh, that require of exascale uh, computing, and we call that those uh, exascale computational challenges. So we identified several problems in the area of solid earth for which exascale, in a broad sense, uh, uh, may be needed. I will I will talk about this uh, later on. Then we identified uh, several uh, codes in the domain of, of solid earth, uh, uh, specifically ten codes. And uh, we are now, uh, during the first half of the project, preparing uh, this course for the upcoming uh, architectures. Uh, I have to say that this is a very diverse, uh, very transversal center of excellence. So we have codes in many different areas. We have codes in computational seismology, in volcanology, codes for tsunamis, and, and so on. And then uh, a key point of, of, the, of cheese is that we are using these codes together with uh, rather complex uh, workflows and what we call pilot demonstrators, which essentially are uh, proofs of concept in where, where the codes and the workflows are used towards a future enabling of services oriented to society on several aspects of geohazard, like uh, hazard assessment, urgent computing, early warning, and so on. Apart from that, we also, of course, have uh, the objective to integrate all the solid earth community around HPC. And uh, we will do that through the, the, the European Plate Observatory System. Also, training is, uh, training is a very important uh, component of CHIS. And of course, we are also fostering uh, the use of uh, tier zero based uh, emergency service in the future, like, for example, Origin computing in the frame of uh, praise and Euro HPC. So, as I already mentioned, we had uh, identified several exascale uh, uh, computational challenges on different solid earth areas, on computational seismology, magnetohydrodynamics, uh, volcanology, tsunamis, and others. The point here is that uh, we understand here exascale in a very, you know, much broader sense, in the sense that we identify problems which actually require of a monolithic uh, run uh, exascale simulation. That, that's clear. This is the case, for example, of the full waveform inversion in computational seismology. But we have other problems which actually uh, we can already solve them in current uh, pre uh, exascale machines but not with the time constraints that an, emer an, an emergency situation requires. So uh, here, uh, exascale can be also understood as a way of solving a not very, very large problem, but uh, solving the problem very, very fast. And this is why we also deal with uh, exascale-like uh, workflows, let's say. So which are the codes? This is the list of the 10 codes that we have identified. These were already very heterogeneous from the beginning. So for instance, in the area of computational seismology, we have uh, four codes that uh, were already uh, well performed, I would say. So this codes with a scalability proven with uh, tens of thousands of processes already. So this is what we call level one code and now shown here in green. But then we also had uh, other types of codes, uh, like those in yellow or in red, which uh, were less performant at the beginning. So that's level two and level three codes, respectively. And those are codes which scaled up to, at the beginning of the project, up to a few thousand or um, around two, three thousand codes only, right? So we started from a very heterogeneous uh, starting point. And the idea is to progressively, during the, during the course of the project, increment, at least for codes of level two and three, the level of, uh, of uh, performance of these codes. Uh, 
So the first thing we did, we did, uh, we did an audit of the 10 codes in close collaboration with uh, the POP. Uh, most of the codes in cheese were analyzed uh, by POP, except uh, with a few exceptions. And this was very useful for us to identify bottlenecks, particularly in level two and level three codes, and start working on uh, a Tyler solution for each specific code on single node or multi-node optimizations, addressing uh, some I bottlenecks that we identify and so on. So we are conducting now a very important task within one specific work package uh, within Cheese uh, for preparation of, of these codes. Uh, in parallel with this, we are also developing uh, the pilot demonstrations and uh, during the third year of the project, there will be a transition from these uh, pilot demonstrations into uh, services or at least into testing the pilots in a service-like environment. No? So we identified uh, 12 uh, different pilots, which are clear, very clear applications listed here. And some of them, uh, to be specific, eight pilots out of the 12 will evolve into a service during the course of the project. A service on different aspects, on ocean computing, on hazard assessment, or in watching, for example. And those are the codes that, the pilots, sorry, that at the beginning of the project were at a higher technology readiness level. So the purpose here uh, during this transition from pilots to service is to increase by at least two or three points in the TRL of most of the pilots. This is what uh, we have started uh, to do now. I'm going to show you just uh, some examples of the pilots. I don't have time to go into details uh, to all the, the 12 pilots, but just to show you some examples. This pilot number one, which deals with urgent seismic simulations, the situation here is that we want to explore which are the real uh, possibilities of using using uh, urgent supercomputing to obtain uh, very, very fast ground shaking maps after an earthquake. The situation is, is uh, indicated in this, in this uh, workflow, in the plot. So the idea is that uh, there is an airport, an earthquake somewhere in Europe or elsewhere in the world. And as soon as uh, uh, this earthquake is uh, registered, we can uh, retrieve information on the focal mechanisms, uh, the characteristics of the hole that generated the earthquake, and so on. And with that, we run, we launch a very, in an automatic uh, way, we, <coughs> we launch a very high resolution simulation to obtain ground shaking maps. And why we want that? We want that because this is a very useful information for uh, civil protection authorities in order to uh, manage uh, a crisis and to have an idea of where uh, the airport that has occurred could have caused uh, the larger number of casualties or, or impacts. So this is a, a product which is especially tailored to those uh, decision makers and in particular in the case of Iceland and Italy we have the civil protections involved in the center of excellence and we are working close collaboration with them in order to develop this future service for these two countries. This is another example, in this case for tsunamis. Uh, the particular case of tsunamis is that once uh, an earthquake occurs in the sea and triggers a tsunami, uh, you have uh, very little time to react. So typically, uh, you have uh, a few minutes, let's say around 10, uh, 15, 20 minutes for uh, producing a tsunami alert message which uh, implies the evacuation of the coastal zones, or at least a few hundred meters uh, uh, closer to the shore. Uh, in this case, uh, it's very unrealistic to assume that we can uh, really run a simulation. So the strategy here is to have a very, very large database of pre-computed uh, tsunami scenarios. And then as soon as uh, there are evidences from sea boys that uh, the wave is propagating. Uh, use uh, data analytics to extract, to combine the different pre-run simulations and to uh, deliver uh, to the authorities uh, expected impacts of the tsunami on at least 17,000 built points in the case of Europe. No? So we are using uh, a code for this, which is called Tsunami High Sea. And which runs on on, uh, on GPUs, and show you here some of the results uh, of the test that we did on on the Volta 100 
uh, at BSE. This is another example of a pilot that we use for um, probabilistic uh, hazard assessment, in this particular case for a physics-based se seismic hazard assessment. And here, we, this is really, really an, an exascale problem as well, because we want to do this uh, physics-based. Uh, the state of the art now is to use what uh, is uh, called ground prediction motion equations, which are semi-analytical models for computing the, has the, ha the hazard, but the approach of cheese is uh, to use a physics-based model. Essentially, this is to have uh, many, many thousands of uh, future scenarios. Take, for example, the image that you see in the center, uh, where there is a large fall, and the problem is that uh, we don't know where the next earthquake will occur, at which exact point, and which will be the exact characteristics of the rupture of the fall, and the focal mechanism, so on and so on. Uh, what you need to do here is to generate a thousand of possible uh, scenarios and combine them in a probabilistic way to produce the so-called hazard maps, which essentially give you the probability of impact around a specific area. For example, this pilot is focusing on, on two different areas in Iceland, one in the north and one in the south, and is uh, running uh, thousands of uh, simulations with uh, real 3D velocity models for the crust to uh, obtain uh, these final uh, hazard maps, which are um, very interesting, very relevant information uh, for uh, decision makers and policy makers as well in the seis in seismic areas. Uh, this is another example of a pilot which is already operational in the European Emergency Service, and this is the probabilistic tsunami forecast. Uh, this is very closely related to what I have shown before in the case of tsunamis, but uh, for a few event. So again, we have here thousands of uh, virtual boys uh, around the Mediterranean and on the coast, and the idea here is to identify and to do a kind of probabilistic hazard assessment uh, as well. So it is supposed to kind of uh, trade-off between the accuracy of the model and uh, the earliness of the response that we want to give. Uh, so for example, just uh, to give uh, some example here, what we obtain is on, 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 on a very short time, uh, the impacts on those different voice, uh, the inundation maps, which could be the uh, the impact of the way that of the wave that is uh, has been generated by the tsunami before reaching the coast. That's another interesting example that uh, we are also dealing with, and is related to the atmospheric dispersion of volcanic ash. As you know, explosive eruptions can uh, send to the atmosphere uh, large quantities of uh, fine ash and aerosols, which are dispersed by the regional and the dominant winds and uh, can impact very vast areas downwind, even at continental scale. If you remember, for example, what happened in Europe in 2010, now it's, it's going to be the 10th anniversary of the Eyalajjökull uh, eruption in Iceland. That uh, uh, caused uh, a disruption of the European air traffic for more than a week. So there is also very uh, large interest from all the aviation industry here to uh, forecast these events and to know which could be, in the case of an eruption, uh, the impacted uh, areas. Uh, of course, there are some current operational services in place already in Europe and elsewhere in the world to do this, but the problem is that at present, the resolution in terms of space and time that uh, these uh, official institutions are giving are not in practice very useful uh, for the civil aviation because uh, these people, they work on another time constraints. Okay, So the, the official products existing do not fulfill the real needs of the industry. And one of the objectives of this project is to increase a lot uh, the resolution in terms of space and time and give a product that is compatible with the needs of the aviation industries. And for this, of course, we have also to deal with uncertainty. I haven't mentioned that, but uncertainty is always behind all the pilots and cheese because uh, in most of the applications in natural hazards, we have a lot of uncertainties about uh, the source terms. So actually what uh, we do, for example, in this case is to run uh, many tens of S scenarios 
uh, do uh, an ensemble forecast. And of course, if we have uh, observations in this particular case from satellites, this is one example of an eruption in, in Chile that affected uh, Argentina. So we have satellite observations also. We assimilate the data and then we produce uh, uh, an analysis and a subsequent forecast based on a real time and data simulation of satellite observations. Typically, uh, these satellite observations are available now at a very high resolution every 15 minutes. So the idea is that while you run the model, you ingest in the workflow, you receive the uh, satellite information, you process the information, you ingest this information into the model, and you do your forecast for the next 24 or 72 hours or whatever is required by the final user. So this is uh, another example of, uh, of applications. Uh, apart from codes, workflows, and pilots, of course, uh, training is also playing a very important role in cheese, and we have uh, an important HPC ecosystem in which we have collaborated both in training and outreach. This is a non-exhaustive non list of what we did uh, last year. Uh, we organized two uh, Patsy courses. There was one uh, also two more for this for this year. One unfortunately had to be cancelled because it was uh, last week in, in Chineca. And of course we have collaborated with uh, POP, Focus and, and many other European uh, projects and initiatives. Uh, apart from Europe, uh, we also have uh, been in contact and doing training and outreach uh, in several parts of Asia and South America as well. So cheese, uh, uh, because natural hazards do not understand our frontiers. And we have also strong commitment of uh, using our codes and our service in any part of the world in which uh, it might be required. Okay. We have also applied for a Galileo conference. This is a very important event organized by the European Geosciences Union. And these are very, very quite high quality and reputed uh, conferences. So we are still waiting for the response, whether we are accepted or not to give this conference on, on, on how computational geosciences and HPC will be in the excess scale area in the particular case of in the particular area of, of solid earth. Uh, in terms of user communities and services, so GIS wants to be a hub which somehow links uh, several components. We have uh, what we call the industry and user board, which is an uh, ever-growing community of uh, users encompassing uh, governmental bodies, academic associations, other European projects or research network, private companies, and so on. We are now I think that we have more than 24 or 25, something around that number. Of, of members, these are people that are monitoring the project, are collaborating with us in the uh, design of the feeder services through the pilot demonstrations. So we are obtaining feedback from them and uh, tailoring the results to the final user needs. Uh, this is very close, closely related to the future exploitation opportunities for the Center of Excellence. So we are also working a lot on the development strategies for uh, future enabling of uh, HPC-based uh, services and enabling. Uh, I didn't mention that, but all the codes in Chiefs are open source code and all the codes and workflows will be available through the, the EPOS infrastructure. EPOS is a very relevant in our sector uh, initiative and we will merge uh, everything uh, within EPOS uh, with all the data in the workflows following the metadata requirements uh, for, um, let's say, merging our pilots and codes in all the EPOS uh, in databases and so on. And that's pretty much the presentation of this. So I'm keen to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arnaud, for this, for your presentation. And uh, if you see in the chat, there is a question by Andres Gomez from uh, CESGA. Maybe you can read that or, you, or do you want me to? Uh, which is the typical time deadline for urgent seismic simulations on real cases before simulation is useless? One hour, two hours, 10 hours. 
Well, that depends. Uh, for example, in the case of tsunami, we are talking about 15 minutes maximum. In the case of earthquakes, earthquakes are unfortunately we are not able to predict earthquakes. So in this case, urgent simulation, urgent computing is always a postmortem. Uh, it means that we can only simulate the earthquake once it, this has happened. And here, urgent, uh, the time window for urgent, I would put it around several hours, which is the time that uh, the, civil and the decision makers and the people, the Red Cross, every people that have to act on the ground to take palliation uh, uh, measures or rescue teams and so on, uh, need to react. So let's say few hours, uh, half day maximum. So it depends on the case, but from 15 minutes to less than one day to answer the question. And then he also is asking, do you consider to have backup centers? Yes, uh, there is redundancy here. So uh, the plan is to have at least uh, all the simulations done in two centers at the same time, in case one is affected by the natural hazard. Yes. Can you estimate the level of destruction on one area to help in the planification of the ideas. Exactly, this is the purpose of uh, some pilots. So for example, the seismic one gives you ground shaking maps, which are then merged into uh, exposure databases to know the damage that these earthquakes has uh, caused on all the assets, infrastructures, and so on. And yes, so you can only, you, you um, at the end, you do not only deliver the map, but you also deliver the level of expected impact. Thank you, this tools. Uh, there is another question here by Mycon. Uh, thank you, uh, these tools are integrated with some warning system. If not, what's the path to achieve that? Yes, uh, well, not yet. We are uh, at a proof of concept level, but nonetheless, some of them are already integrated in some warning system. For example, the tsunami pilots are already integrated in Aristotle. Aristotle is uh, also a project that delivers products to the European Civil uh, Protection Agency. So whenever there is a, uh, an emergency in Europe uh, related to natural hazards, not only, but mostly natural hazards, there is a high level uh, a coordination committee which gathers all the European civil protection and we are already delivering products uh, to those uh, decision makers at an European level. Yes.